Good day, Matt. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this Skype interview with me. Uh, we've known each other for about two decades now, I think, through our association with the ISPI, International Society for Performance Improvement. But for our audience, could you please introduce yourself to them and tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and where you do it? Sure. Sure. Well, I'm Matthew Richter, and uh, I'm the president of the Tiagi Group, which sounds way more impressive than it actually is because there's only two of us in the company, and Tiagi's ranked higher than me. Hmm. So, uh, he's CEO. So, I've been with Tiagi, uh, oh gosh, off and on for over 20 years now, and uh, have been a partner in the company since 2003. Uh, I focus on designing training, delivering training, and uh, and actually if you were to ask me what I do if, and you weren't in this field, I would say I get hired to solve problems, mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. around learning or performance. So uh, that's what I do. I've noticed that uh, you travel quite a bit for your work. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of that? Well, we're lucky. We have clients all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. lately, I've been able to spend quite a bit of time in the UK, in France, China, uh, and of course, all over the US. Uh, you know my partner, Tiagi. He mm -hmm. uh, just got back from Shanghai and South America. And, and so we're very, very, very lucky to be able to work with people all over the world. Very cool. Can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to human performance technology or whatever it is that you might call performance improvement? Yeah, I was a psychology grad student and I was visiting Tiagi and uh, I was very, uh, I was full of hubris with all the cocksuredness that a graduate student has and I was trying to explain to Tiagi why he was wrong about some issue. Mm -hmm. And he drew up on the, a whiteboard human performance technology and, and the logical thought process mm -hmm. as a way of proving me an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, and that was my first introduction. And he said, you should get involved with this group ISPI. And he explained that he had been with the group since the early 70s and, and that it was a great foundation for everything that I was aspiring to do and to be. And, and uh, he got me involved with ISPI. Well, very cool. So besides Tiagi, um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, other influences in performance improvement, other people, books, or articles that uh, other others might want to follow up with? Well, sure. I mean, I never had a chance to meet him, but Tom Gilbert, mm -hmm. uh, his book was, it's kind of the Bible. Uh, and it was one of the foundational texts that, that Tiagi gave me and, and uh, it really was inspirational. Dale Danifer, of course. Uh, I, I think I sat through every lecture I could from him mm -hmm. uh, in the mid-90s. And uh, I think he, he's since retired, I believe, mm -hmm. but uh, there's still a lot of video and books out there from him. Uh, my current hero right now is Will Talheimer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Will has uh, his book on Smiley Sheets is... Uh, something I buy for all my clients right now, and and of course all of his videos are just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, you you've been a mentor to me for the last twenty years. Well, I hope I didn't steer you too wrong then. <coughs> uh, Tiagi fixes everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you for that. So, when you describe to people what it is you do, do you have something along the lines of a 30 second elevator speech on uh, human performance technology or what it is that uh, you might call well i think the secret is to not mention hpt yes <laughs> don't don't bring it up right mm -hmm. and and so what i like to tell people is i i help you solve your problem mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. let's identify your business issue let's explore what the causal issues are for that issue to to be there let's uh identify possible solutions for solving that problem and and we'll execute that solution and we'll measure how good we're doing right which is pretty much outlining hpt mm -hmm. but i don't ever call it hpt i, I find the word uh technologist to be scary mm -hmm. kind of creepy 
and uh, human performance, uh, well, probably has some political issues around it. <laughs> uh, so I, I try and avoid the phrases okay. and talk a lot about the meaning. Okay, very good. So where are you focused for your own learning currently? You mentioned Will Tallheimer a minute ago. Um, so what are you exploring? Well, I've been really enjoying a lot of the videos you've been posting uh, from some of the elders in the field. Uh, Julie Dirksen, Patty Shank, uh, Ruth Clark all have wonderful books uh, on some of the current uh, literature out there. Mm -hmm. Will, of course, and his videos. But my biggest passion right now is actually studying history. Um, and I'm finding that there's a tremendous amount in in both academic and popular history literature that we can bring into uh, our, our business environments and, and looking at how we explore leadership and how we explore management and there are examples on a grand scale in, in world politics that we can call from and draw lessons from that we can pull into our daily daily work lives and so history has become my big passion right now well, that's a great segue into your book, which, as I understand it, is to be a triology at some point. But uh, your your book on the leadership story, which has a lot of historical references in it, uh, tell us a little it bit about that. may explain why only two people have bought it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about that particular book and where you're going to take the uh, series. Uh, sure. Well, the, the first book, I'm almost done with the second one. Uh, the first book ex explores leadership uh, as a, a simple model. Uh, it's almost banal because it says that leadership is a function of three things, all of which are pretty obvious. One is context. You know, you can't have a leader uh, absent context. Uh, there's a, a function of time, meaning that as we are close to a leadership event or farther away, that changes how we understand or perceive what happened with the leader. And then, of course, our perspective, your frame of reference, your experience uh, as a follower or an acolyte or the person who's marketing this leader. So you have three different functions, perspective, time, and, and context, which dictate who is and what is leadership. Uh, and because of that, you can't really ascribe the term leader to someone until after they've led. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes really a reflective or uh, a story. It's truly a narrative that we create or co-construct with either the leader or the people who are marketing this leader. And so if we look at leadership that way, we can almost start to look at leadership post-events so that we can retell how it's happened and we can learn how we can behave in the future or we can learn how we can behave currently, or we can learn how to uh, reiterate what's occurred in the past mm -hmm. if we want to tell different stories. Uh, and politics enables us, or at least historical politics, looking at the lives of people like Franklin Roosevelt, Chamberlain, Gandhi, Francois Mitterrand, um, Thatcher, Reagan, any of these folks, we can learn a tremendous amount about their, uh, their narratives who told their stories, how their stories have evolved, and as time has passed, how those stories have changed. And what that says about us as a culture today, what it says about where we're heading, and why we have Trump today, or Brexit, or other horrible events that are occurring in the present, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, moving forward, I want to just tell stories. So uh, one of the big chapters in the, the second uh, edition, the second book, uh, is the story of Francois Mitterrand, who's, uh, who was the president of France in the 90s. And he was phenomenal at retelling his story, just changing it. Mm -hmm. He would literally rewrite his history. And, and it was fascinating how he could do that authentically and genuinely, and people would believe it and follow him. And and there were people who hated him and told the opposite story. And you'd see this battle of narratives. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's similar to what we have going on today. And I just find that fascinating. And, and uh, it, it lends itself to a discussion of how we view our business leaders. 
Uh, Steve Jobs is a hero to many people, and yet he's the antithesis to many of the characteristics we try and teach in leadership training. Mm -hmm. And so, or he was. Uh, so, given that, that, that can lend itself to quite a few discussions about intention and, and about uh, what we care about really and uh, what we'll allow in our work environments and so forth. So the second book is almost done. What is its title and uh, when might it be available? Uh, I don't have a new title yet, ah. <laughs> uh, but I, right now I'm just saying more leadership stories. Okay. So we have to get more creative. On it, so. <laughs> and what will the third book then be called? <laughs> Even more uh, well, leadership stories. So the, the stories in the first book centered around uh, American leaders. Uh, so we talked a lot about U.S. American presidents or, or almost presidents. And uh, the second volume is focused on European leaders. The third volume, I decided to hop on the Me Too movement, is all about women. And actually, I now have a fourth one planned, which will look at Asian leaders. So, And don't I'm not ignoring Africa or South America. We'll get there eventually. Yeah. I'm still young. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask you to define a term used in our business, human performance technology or instructional design and development, um, that you perhaps see needs a clearer definition because people have misconstrued it or are defining it incorrectly in your view. Do you have a term for us that you can share? I think evaluation. Uh, when we talk about evaluation within the process, I think it's it's uh, at best has too many definitions mm -hmm. or applications, mm -hmm. and at worst is unclear uh, in how we look at evaluation. Too many people, I think, evaluate on a superficial level, um, or they rely on things like the Kirkpatrick model when they're they're looking at learning, which I think is at least with levels one and two. Uh, uh, not just superficial, but missing many of the factors um, uh, of proper evaluation. Um, so I, I would love to see us look at evaluation more clearly, break it down using different terminology. So if we're looking at learning, uh, we can look at learning and evaluate in multiple capacities. Um, right now I love Will's uh, tiers. I forget how many tiers he's using right now. It's either eight or fourteen or something. Mm -hmm. He's broken it down beautifully uh, on different levels for us to evaluate the quality of learning at at different points in the process. Um, are we evaluating a, a learning package, and how do we do that, and what's efficacy look like mm -hmm. um, when we're looking at evaluating uh, the impact of an intervention? Uh, you know, how do we do that? And so uh, I think we, we take the word evaluation and use it as a blanket term for measuring, and it doesn't lend a lot of direction uh, for non-dedicated um, non practitioners to grasp it quickly. So you don't, need so, so you don't have a uh, short, succinct uh, definition of evaluation that you would share, or... You're just pointing out that it's the the current use of the term is problematic. Oh, I, my my apologies. If you want my definition of it, or you want yes, if you have if you have one. one. Okay. Uh, so for me, evaluating is evaluating uh, at different points within the intervention. So we're evaluating the learning. We're evaluating the complete intervention. We're evaluating the program. And at each level, we need to look at the variant factors uh, for doing so. So if it's learning, we're not just looking at regurgitation. We're also looking at how people behave and perform and remember the task and put it into muscle memory. Um, in terms of the program, we're looking at applied back on the job. In terms of... Uh, the uh, intervention, how well are people actually performing these skills within the class or within the learning setting and so forth. So uh, I really will hone in on the specific part of the intervention and get specific. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. 
So we've reached that part of the interview where I would like to ask you for some stories to help keep the memories of uh, perhaps people from the past or current uh, practitioners. Uh, so do you have any funny stories or serious stories about uh, people in the business that you can share with us? Well, the, many, many, many years ago, we were at a con an ISPI conference. I think it was in Dallas. I think Tiagi and I were running that conference. I can't remember what year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had set up a debate between you and me and Tiagi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were sitting on the panel, and I was all ready. I had my notes ready. I was, I w you know, we had a whole set of questions and everything. And I remember sitting there with my head going back and forth between you and Tiagi, never getting a word in edgewise as the two of you uh, agreed, disagreed, agreed to disagree. And, uh, and I don't think I said one word throughout the entire session, uh, just in awe of the two of you going back and forth. Uh, and I'll never, I'll never forget that. That was fun. <laughs> I now I recall that, but I wouldn't. Uh, I remember doing the, those sessions with you guys. That was it was fun. Um, that was great. Uh, and then uh, I was in Barcelona, uh, I think two years ago, with Will mm -hmm. and Julie Dirksen, and uh, uh, we had just finished doing some programs there, and. Uh, I would say the three of us are relatively intelligent people, uh, and we got so lost in Barcelona, yeah. <laughs> and we we were walking down streets. We'd see the same sights over and over again, and uh, three intelligent people could not find their way back to the hotel. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about Julie and uh, uh, for our audience here. What have you learned so, from her, and or uh, what other experiences have you had? Uh, Julie's got some of the best books on instructional design. She's taken uh, a very dry and uh, a dry topic where there's probably a lot of disagreement in the field, and she's built a concise, definitive process that people can follow to build courseware. And uh, I find that uh, if it's it's something that I need to convey to someone quickly. I'll pull one of her books off the shelf and give it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie's one of the best process people I've met. She's just great. Uh, and she's got a tremendous amount of stuff on the process of instructional design, Excellent. specifically around e-learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, more, any more experiences uh, with Will Talhammer? Uh Nothing I think I can put on public airing. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's fair enough. Now, certainly you have stories that you can share uh, with us about uh, Tiagi. Uh, sure. Uh, give, me a, give me a topic area you're interested in. Well, tra traveling with Tiagi. Uh, so there, there's a, a story. I'm not going to mention the name of the gentleman. He's a fellow ISPI friend of ours. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't have permission to share the story about him. But we were in New York City, and uh, I think it was an ISPI conference of, again. And Tiagi, of course, wanted to go to a South Indian restaurant, which those of you who know Tiagi, we always find the South Indian restaurant in whatever town we're in. And we're on the way there, and this friend of ours made a comment about Tiagi being a vegetarian, and I just laughed because Tiagi and I had chicken McNuggets earlier that day. <laughs> so uh, I said, Tiagi's not a vegetarian. And uh, Tiagi feigned his surprise and said, what, what? And uh, the gentleman got very angry with me for, for attacking Tiagi this way. And, and uh, we went to the Indian restaurant and throughout the entire dinner, Tiagi refused to admit that he was eating chicken nuggets. <laughs> and... Uh, and this friend of ours uh, uh, did not appreciate the joke, of course. But uh, he still talks to Tiagi. I don't think he's forgiven me. <laughs> so, question, so someone asked me, I think it was Joe Harless, back in 2012 when he was going to uh, the ISPI conference, the 50th anniversary conference, and he, he asked me, 
How is it that Tiagi still has this accent if it, after being in the U.S. all these years? So what's your take on that? How does he retain this accent here? Is it just part of his uh, charm that he doesn't want to lose that accent? Um, well, I, th- I think actually, I mean, I'll give you a serious answer, which is people don't lose their accents. Okay. Uh, I don't think people over time, unless they specifically go for training, mm-hmm. uh, diction, lose their accent and... You know, you learn to say the words the way you learn to say them, and it becomes muscle memory, and you say them that way. Um, uh, my my wife has been speaking English for quite a while. She still has a French accent. Mm-hmm. And I have my American accent when I go to the UK, and over years we don't we don't lose that. Um, so he has an accent, and it's it's ingrained in who he is. But uh, when he speaks Tamil, he certainly doesn't have an accent. <laughs> uh, when I speak Tamil, I do. Yeah. So I, I don't think, and uh, I'm I'm not a I'm not a linguist. I don't know if this is accurate, but I don't believe people lose their accents once they develop a fluency. Very good answer. Um, any other stories that uh, you can share with uh, with us about uh, from your work experiences, things that you've learned uh, out on the road? Well, I, I think what, what Tiagi and I were talking about this the other day because we're we're doing a class right now on our rapid instructional design process, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the things that you know you know we design games, we build games. Our focus is activities rather than content. We we want to facilitate people through the content, but we do so using activities and. And so, because we have such a wide body of activities, you, we end up having our favorites, right? Right. And so, there are activities that are just so much fun to run. And so, we develop the, this strong desire or habit to run those activities, even when they're inappropriate. And uh, many, many years ago, there was an activity Tiagi uh, taught me called The Meaning of Life, which is a facilitated story about cancer and dying and it has a very targeted usage mm-hmm. which is when we work with hospice care workers you know to to give them a more visceral simulated experience of what it's like to be the patient mm-hmm. but there were, as a 20 something young trainer I wanted to emotionally have an impact on people and so I would use this activity for the dumbest reasons mm-hmm. I mean there was absolutely no instructional value for me using this activity. Mm-hmm. And Tiagi would get so annoyed with me, you know, you, and you can't use activities without purpose. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so one of the things I learned very early on when someone ran out of the room crying as a result of this activity was purpose and to do no harm, um, but that your activity has to align to the, the objective. And, uh, and it's so easy when you're playing games uh, as a platform for what you do to get caught in the playing mm-hmm. and lose sight of the learning. And that was probably one of the most important lessons I ever had it was you sh- make it align. Mm-hmm. You shared that story on LinkedIn not too long ago, I think. Not not the yeah. total, total yeah. story, but your, uh, your past... Uh, uh, guilt in uh, using stories that uh, didn't necessarily align with the learning objectives, but no, but they were fun to use, right? <laughs> yeah, and, I think, you know, I, I think in the '90s there were all sorts of trainers would use ball toss activities and get people to make silly sounds. And mm-hmm. this is why we trainers have a very bad reputation: yes. dumb activities that had no point. Mm-hmm. And I think it's our responsibility to never lose sight of that alignment requirement. An activity has to facilitate content toward an outcome. And if it doesn't, don't play the game. Um, Excellent. I used to, in leadership training, make people read biographies. Mm-hmm. You know, This was a long time ago. And Tiagi said, remove my name from this course. <laughs> <laughs> this has no purpose to learning. <laughs> so. Well, we all learn these lessons uh, in a myriad of ways. Matt, thank you so much for spending some time with me and uh, participating in this interview. Um, are there any uh, final words of wisdom you'd like to share with the audience before we go? Uh, I just want to apologize. I think I shared with you before we start recording, I'm a fraud. 
Uh, I'm not an HPT guy, and uh, so as a part of the Legacy series, I feel like I should I should uh, cop to that mm -hmm. and make sure people don't don't think I belong uh, as a legacy member. Uh, I think uh, I think you're you're you've asked me to join you as a representative uh, from Tiagi's group, uh, but uh, I, I just want to make sure people know I'm I am not uh, I, I have not been ingrained in the HPT the way some of the other folks have been, and I, I don't want to well, I'll missile. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, associate myself with them in a way that would be insulting to them. Well, I think that you've been involved in improving people's performance and really, bottom line, that's the objective of human performance technology or performance improvement or whatever anyone chooses to call that. Uh, and you've been successful at that. You've had repeat business because clients like what you do. Um, as you say, Tiagi would have kept you on the on a short leash and made sure that. Uh, uh, and you mean he still does? <laughs> <laughs> He's wonderful. You're wonderful too. Thank you for sharing with us uh, today. Thank you, and, and thank you for everything you've given me over the years. Oh, you're most welcome. Uh, paying it forward is the is the key to life at this point. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care. Bye bye.